Eidos. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Ghost Thief Deadly Shadows. I've really been looking forward to this because this is the first time I have ever played Thief 3 on an actually decent computer, and that's exciting to me. Because the movie files aren't separate in this game, I'm going to just include them in the playthrough. So I'm going to wait here at the menu screen until the intro movie plays, and I'll shut up as soon as it starts. But I have to begin by saying, of course, that while I'll be following the ghost rules to the best of my ability, there are enough Cry, brethren, for the betrayer is come. Your hands will be crippled and you will perish as the wretched outcast in the bleak unwritten, and you will know the face of the destroyer. Recovered text from the prophesitus, missing for 132 years. I love that intro cutscene. Anyway, I'm gonna hit new game, and I think Garrett will start the briefing, so I'll talk to you again after he's done. I got a tip last night from my fence. Heartless Perry. A nobleman named Lord Julian had some sort of quarrel, and showed up at a local inn well after nightfall, and in a foul mood. He's carrying a velvet bag, about the size of a man's fist, and it never leaves his sight. Sounds likely to be valuable. But I'll know for sure when I steal it from him. Perry sent over a floor plan of the place, the Blue Heron Inn. Finding his lordship won't be hard. His room number will be in the guest register, if I can get to the front desk to read it. The inn will have guards, but not as many as a private estate. That should make things easy, which is one of the reasons I'm willing to try it without knowing for sure what the take will be. Lord Julian is so protective of that bag, there's got to be something of value in it. First, let me talk about Thief Deadly Shadows, or I'm going to call it Thief 3 in general. I like Thief 3 a lot. A lot of people who played, who have been playing since the first two games hate this game, and I don't really understand why. I think that they're too hung up on little details, like a lot of people are really angry that rope arrows are gone, but that didn't matter so much to me. A lot of people were really angry that swimming was gone, and that didn't matter that much to me either. People complain about the way pe everyone's far too focused on graphics, but souping up the graphics can make a big difference. I'll just say that right away. We all like to pretend we're jaded to it, but all, things, all other things equal, a better looking game is better. There are many things that I like better about Thief 3. I like the lockpicking better. I like the 
AI enhancements a lot. They're much smarter, they notice things that they should notice, like missing loot, doors open and shut, that sort of thing. I like the city hubs. I do think that they needed a little more meat on them. I thought they were a little skeletally implemented, but I really enjoy the sense of continuity that they lend to the game. I like that we're just in the city and we're carrying out missions in the city and we can see the places where the missions take place before we ever go into them while we're walking around the city streets. I just like that the sense of linearity that goes that accompanies going from mission to mission to mission is gone. With all these things I'm saying I like, you might be saying, but Travis, you always say that Thief 3 is your least favorite. Why is that the case? You complained so much during Thief 2 about all the glitches and bugs and the fact that it was unfinished and unpolished. And indeed, I do think that Thief 3 is better than Thief 2, at least, in a lot of ways, in that there are far fewer glitches, far fewer bugs, the missions are all finished and detailed, and there's nothing missing, everything is complete. But, the reason that Thief 3 suffers is because it was one of the two games, the other being Deus Ex 2, that kind of initially coined the term consolitis. Remember, this is back in the days of the original Xbox, not the Xbox 360, and so there were pr some pretty serious technical constraints on this game. That caused it to have two persistent flaws that are present for the entire game that really undermine the experience. The first is that the levels are tiny. I mean small. An entire mission in this game will physically be about the same size as maybe one wing of one floor of Gervasius' mansion at the end of Thief 2. I hate how tiny the missions are, and that's true the entire game. All of the missions are small, period. The other thing, and it's another technical constraint from the original Xbox, even playing on a good computer, you're going to notice over and over again, load times. They aren't that long, it can load in about five seconds, but back in Thief and Thief 2, it was almost instant. And, you know, on a modern machine, playing on an Alienware computer, there's just no excuse for load times to be anything other than instant, especially in a game this old with levels that small. And the problem with those two flaws is that they're persistent. They are there annoying me the entire time I'm playing. As many flaws as Thief 2 had, as many glitches and bugs as I had to deal with, they were kind of randomized, they were kind of spread out, and there was a big variety of them, you know what I mean? I was always surprised because it wasn't consistent. Sometimes I'd hit a bug, sometimes it would work fine, and the bugs that I hit were different, whether it be a stuck patroller, or a shadow that wasn't working the way it should be, or some unfinished text, whatever. But the big flaws with Thief 3, the small levels and the load times, are present the entire game. They're there the whole time. I have to deal with them over and over and over and over again. And that's why, as much as I complained about Thief 2, I do in fact still like it better than Thief 3. But I don't hate Thief 3 the way other people do. I really like it. I think that it is a better game for them to build on for Thief 4 in many ways. I particularly like, as I said, the idea of the hubs. I like the levels. I think that the AI models are pretty dated now, seven, eight years later, eight years later, 2012, 2004, that's eight. But I think that the levels still look gorgeous. They haven't aged at all. And the other thing about Thief 3 in general, I have to talk about the rules of this playthrough and how the ghost rules interact with Thief 3, because the ghost rules were written for Thief 1 and Thief 2. There are a lot of differences in Thief 3, and there's never been any official word on how to incorporate those differences. I'll go through some of them here, and you can read the rules that I've settled on for myself in this playthrough in my video descriptions. First of all, there are different AI alert levels in Thief 3. You have, and the game's files call them green, yellow, red, and combat. Four different states and idle, I guess, five states, where there were only four states in the first two games. You remember in the first two, there was completely unnoticed, a first alert where a guard would say something and not do anything else, a second alert where a guard would start to look for me, and then if he ever actually caught me, he'd enter combat mode. In Thief 3, there's idle mode, there's what we call the green alert, which essentially matches the first alert from 
the first two games in that they say something, they... It's not exactly the same, though, because with a green alert, a patrolling AI will pause and a stationary AI will turn his head back and forth and look around a little bit, which you can actually use to your advantage. That's another thing that I really like about Thief 3. They got rid of a lot of the glitches. You can't nudge guards anymore. You can't lean through banners. You can't do anything like that. But guards will look at each other when they pass by and say things to each other. They'll turn their heads, and you can actually take advantage of that head turn to get by them unseen. On a green alert, they'll turn their heads back and forth, and they only see where their head is turned. It's not a stationary cone of vision like it was in Thief 1 and 2. And another cool thing about Thief 3 is that the dynamic shadows actually change your visibility, meaning, for example, in my practice run for not the training mission, but the first mission, I was able to hide in the shadow that a guard was dynamically casting when he stood next to a torch. That was something you could not do in Thief 1 and 2. So even though the dark engine glitches are not an option anymore, there are a lot of extra stealth options in Thief 3 to compensate for that. But I kind of digressed. I was talking about alert levels. In Thief 3, a green alert basically matches a classic first alert. They say something, a patroller will pause, look around, nothing too serious. Then there's also what the game calls a red alert, which is pretty well corresponds to the original second alert. A guard will get his weapon out, he'll say things that indicate he's pretty certain you're there, and he'll run off to look for you. Finally, combat mode is when a guard engages you. What's unique to Thief 3 is a middle level alert that the game coding refers to as a yellow alert. In this state, a guard still won't get his weapon out. He's not, his comments indicate that he's still not really sure if he saw or heard something, but he will wander off his patrol path, kind of idly search for a few seconds, and then if he doesn't see or hear anything else, he'll shrug his shoulders and go back to whatever he was doing before. There was a big debate over whether or not yellow alerts should be regarded as ghost busts over on the IDOS forums, and that debate was never officially resolved. They never came out solidly one way or the other, which is why the ghost rules, the official rules, still don't address it. So here's what I'm going to do. As I mentioned, AIs notice things they didn't used to notice. They notice doors that are open or shut, they'll notice when torches go out, they'll uh, notice loot missing. So I'm going to kind of distinguish between different sorts of yellow alerts for my own edification. The ghost rules always said, and granted this was not an actual rule, but just discussing the premise and the spirit of the rules, but they did always say that the only evidence of your passing should be the missing loot. So even though AIs notice it now, I'm not going to regard alerts that are related to missing loot as busts, because I think that the spirit of the rule says missing loot should be the only evidence. That's even true of Supreme Ghost. So I won't regard that as a bust. There's one other thing, too. AIs make a comment when you pickpocket them, but it doesn't seem to actually raise their alert status to green. So I'm personally not going to call it a Supreme bust if an AI notices a pickpocket, because again, it's just missing loot. Otherwise, if I didn't include that, then I would never be able to pickpocket anyone. It wouldn't be an option. You might as well have a supreme rule that says no pickpocketing, which would be ridiculous. And it might sound like I'm going easy on myself, but uh, I just think that anything that's related to the fact that something is missing should be okay. Otherwise, the game becomes, I don't know, defeats the purpose of stealing things if I can't successfully steal things, even if I remain unseen and unheard. I think the spirit of the ghost rules is to remain unseen and unheard, and with that in mind, I will regard it as a supreme bust if I get a green alert related to being seen or heard, and I will regard it as a ghost bust if I get a yellow alert related to being seen or heard. That's how I'm going to interpret things. There is no official rule. If the ghosting community ever finally gets together and creates an official set of rules that contradict what I've laid out here, 
Maybe I'll just have to replay Thief 3. Horror of horrors. I tease, of course, because I do like this game. Finally, although it will become more relevant later, I'm going to go ahead and discuss what to do about the factions. In my first playthrough, I went after the Cornerstones and the Rust Mites, because I wasn't really playing according to any rules. There's no official word yet on whether side missions, like faction requests, side quests in the city hubs, qualify actions for exceptions the same way that an actual objective does in the ghost rules. I'm going to have to assume that they do not. Which means, even to me, that even... So, let me just say at the outset, I'm not going to do any of the faction quests. I'm going to leave them all hostile to me, and there are three reasons for that. The first is the ghost rules themselves. I think that mossing cornerstones uses a moss arrow, which is a violation of a supreme rule, absent an objective to do so, and killing rust mites, even though they don't show up in the statistics as either a kill or damage, I still think you're obviously dealing damage and killing something, and that would be a ghost bust absent an objective. I think that there is an argument to be made that because it's a side mission, it's something that the factions have given you to do, you could argue that this should qualify for the objective exception, assuming that you can do it without alerting anybody. But until, until someone actually says something, I do think that it just doesn't make sense. Well, it, it, it does make sense to me. I do like that argument, but let me tell you the two other reasons I don't want to do it. The second reason is Garrett's character. Garrett doesn't strike me as the type of guy to give a damn whether the Hammerites and Pagans like him or not. So I don't think that absent concrete benefit to himself, he would go out of his way to improve their opinion of him and make, him, make them happy. Just seems out of character to me for Garrett to go do those chores. And the third reason is that it will actually make it easier for me to tell whether or not I've been undetected. This game, and this is another difference that I should talk about now, this game has a lot of different AI states that weren't really present in Thief 1 and 2. Occasionally, you ran into some AIs in the first two games that didn't want to kill you, like when you were out in the city streets in Lord Bafford's Manor, or Basso at the beginning of Thief 2, or the Hammerites during Undercover, but by and large, everything was hostile to you. It was very simple. That's not really the case in Thief 3. Some, the uh, citizens of the city will always just be uh, neutral toward you unless they see you committing a crime. The city watch is always hostile. The keeper enforcers are always hostile. And you can shift the opinion of the hammers, the pagans, and you can't really do anything about it. But as the plot progresses, the opinion of the, ke the keepers have of you shifts too. To me, I want to just stay completely undetected the whole time, and I'm going to try my best to do that. And oddly enough, it's a lot easier for me to tell if I've accomplished that if I keep the factions hostile to me. If they stay hostile, then they'll go through the alerts, just like every city watch, every hostile AI would, and I can tell if I've successfully hidden from them or not. If I build them up to being allied with me, they won't react when they see me. They won't care when they, uh... Well, they, they care. Your faction status drops. But they won't say anything or do anything when you steal loot from their territory. So, in the interest of my own ability to gauge whether or not I'm staying undetected, I want to keep the factions hostile to me. And speaking of the factions, that reminds me of one other thing. It actually is covered by the ghost rules, but, but it bears mentioning here. If you remember Life of the Party and Thief 2 when the archers fought each other, that wasn't a bust because I didn't cause the fight, it was scripted, even though at the end of the fight the archers were searching for me, and if anybody stumbled across a body that I didn't kill, it would still show up in my statistics as a body discovered by enemies. Well, there are a lot of those kind of brawls in this game, both in the mission and in the city streets, especially after the Keeper Enforcers show up, but it even happens a few times before that. I'm not going to mess with any of the bodies, because I think that violates the Supreme Rules. To I think I have to leave everything as it settles, however that might be, and that of course means that my statistics are going to show a lot of bodies discovered, and 
I won't have killed anyone, I won't have done any damage, the statistics will still show that. So I won't be able to trust the body's discovered stat. And one other thing bears mentioning. If I'm close enough to an AI that goes into combat mode, it will flag it as me being caught. Whether or not I was actually seen or heard or the AI was going into combat with me. This happened to me in the first playthrough, and it happened to me again in my practice run. In my uh, first playthrough, I, when I walked through a door into the new city hub before I even came out of the shadows, an enforcer attacked someone right next to me. That person went into combat mode, and it flagged it as me being caught, just because I was close enough to an AI in combat mode. In my practice run, when the stonecutter when that brawl started, you know, when the two thugs killed the stonecutter, the city watch showed up, people went into combat mode, and even though I was squatting in a shadow and no one ever saw or heard me, it popped up as me being caught again. The point being, those statistics aren't really reliable. I'll do, excuse me, I'll do my best to keep those numbers as low as I can, but just because it says I got caught once doesn't mean anyone ever actually saw or heard me. Finally, I think that's all the general comments I need to make. Let's talk about this mission in particular. First of all, a nice little bit of continuity. Because I just played Thief 2, I remember that in Masks, uh, Bram Gervasius' journal mentioned a hunting trip with three nobles on it. One was good old Lord Bafford, one was, of course, Gervasius, and the other was someone we hadn't met named Julian, who caught a nasty cold while they were out on their hunt. Anyway, I'm assuming that this is the same Lord Julian. I like those little bits of continuity that Looking Glass throws in. This mission is not ghostable. Here's why. I don't think... Well, let's look at the objectives. Our objectives are to break into the inn, find out what room Lord Julian is staying in, steal Lord Julian's velvet bag from his room, and leave the inn once we have the velvet bag. Pretty straightforward, but you'll notice that the objectives don't talk about following the training instructions. We're going to be forced to take at least two busts. The game is going to, well, three supreme busts. The game is going to force us to put out a torch in the basement, which is a supreme bust, because, you know, no objective. It will force us to blackjack the innkeeper. Again, no objective, so that's a ghost bust. And when we get to the guards standing outside Lord Julian's room, there truly is no way past him except to actually distract him, which is a ghost bust as well. I think that's everything. We uh, have to play the training mission on normal. We can't select any other difficulties for it. Uh, let's go and look at our starting gear. All we have right now, nothing. We've got no loot, zero cash, Garrett's got his mechanical eye, which we can zoom in and out with, just like he did in Thief 2. We've got 10 water arrows, our blackjack, a dagger. We've got no quest items. We do have a map of the inn. Here's our start point. We'll be out on the streets. I guess we're supposed to sneak around the streets, go in through the cellar delivery hatch. We'll end up coming up these stairs to the front desk, making our way through to the peony suite, heading down the stairs to the Lancaster room, and heading back out to the streets. That's all pretty straightforward. One other general note. Sorry, I keep thinking of things I have to mention. One big difference between the first two games and Thief 3 is that in Thief 3, your inventory, number one, carries over, and number two is capped. For instance, I can only carry a maximum of 25 water arrows, and my inventory carries over from mission to mission. It doesn't reset. I think that that has implications for how we regard items we don't need in the Supreme Ghosting rule, so... I'm going to collect all the items I can, like I did in the first playthroughs, and I'm not going to call picking up those items a bust. I'm, just because the inventory system is so different, I think that it makes sense to say you should get the items because they carry over for the entire game. And I'm not going to, like I did in the first playthrough, I will buy the practice locks just because I like to upgrade Garrett's apartment, and I will buy the climbing gloves. I won't buy any other equipment from the stores. I will fence all of my loot. And I think with that, I'm finally ready to get started. Now, I apologize for what was doubtless a hiccup there. Thief 3 behaves in a really weird fashion. Whenever you try to load a mission or you hit the quick load button to reload your game, anything like that, it 
sort of crashes out temporarily to my desktop. I mean, I see my desktop, whatever I'm running behind the game, and then the game sort of starts back up. And at that point, my video recorder is cut off, so I have to hit the record button again. Fortunately for you guys, I have at least figured out how to splice my videos together, so I can do an entire mission all at once like I did in the first two games. But that's what's happening there. Anyway, welcome to the training mission. Throughout the rest of the game, you will make your own choices and take your own path. In this mission, however, you will be given instructions at every step. To get started, follow the footprints on the ground of the first training experience. And I just, again, I noticed that the levels do look really good. That's my practice run right there. I'm going to leave it be. So here we are at the Blue Heron Inn. To be a thief, you must learn to use stealth. When you hide in shadows, guards will not be able to see you unless they are very close. The light gem at the bottom of the screen will tell you how visible you are. Crouching, moving slowly, and hiding behind objects can also be helpful, but are not always required. In this case, the guard will not see you if you remain in the darkness. Sneak past this guard to proceed. Easy enough. Training successful. Some guards will be on patrols looking for intruders. You must learn to observe your enemies and use careful timing to slip by them while their backs are turned. Sneak past this patrolling guard without getting caught. Okay, easy enough. Training successful. The sounds you make can alert guards, so you must learn to move quietly. Your footsteps are louder when you run and when you cross over loud floor surfaces such as metal. Walk slowly and quietly over this metal surface without alerting the nearby guard. You can creep quietly by holding down shift. What they don't mention, which is my preference, is that you also move quietly if you're crouched. And crouching has the added bonus of making you less visible. All missions have objectives, even this training mission. Your first objective is to break into the inn. You can complete the objective by entering through this delivery hatch. Press F to crouch, then walk through the hatch. When you are inside, press F again to stand up. And I've changed the bindings. I don't think it's F by default. So there, we have completed our objective to break into the inn. And you'll notice notes and restrictions we have none of either. For now. You can use some objects by positioning them in the center of your screen. When they highlight, press right mouse to use them. Use this door to open it and proceed into the next room. And I will, of course, close it behind me. People complained about the funky blue highlight, and I agree it looks funky, I don't really like it, but that, that kind of thing doesn't matter to me that much. Use your bow and water arrow to extinguish that torch on the wall. When guards are nearby, putting out torches creates darkness that you can sneak through. First select the water arrow by pressing 4, then pull and hold the left mouse to aim and release it to fire. Extinguish this torch to proceed. And you'll notice that if you try not to extinguish it, they just teleport you back and force you to do it. So, I will put out the torch. And one interesting thing here, we've got infinite water arrows. So. Might as well stock up to 25, which is as many as it'll let us carry. And we move on. To climb on top of obstacles, get close to them and press space. Climb over these boxes to proceed. Anyway, I'll, I'll just reiterate that, uh, Putting out that torch, I regard it as a supreme bust because there's no objective to follow the training instructions, and in fact I will be able to skip some training instructions at the very end, so even though the game forces me to do it, that's still a supreme bust, I think, as far as the rules are concerned. There may You may be able to argue your way out of things the game forces you to do, but not always. I mean, no, in fact, if there's no objective... It's not excused. And if it doesn't relate to being seen or heard, and when I have to distract the guard later, even though I absolutely have to do it, 
It's a ghost bust. A locked door is no obstacle for a skilled thief. Use this door with right mouse to enter lock picking mode. Then use the mouse to pick the lock. You must find the sweet spot in each stage to make progress. Note any movement on the visual lock indicator to gauge the location of the sweet spot. You are in the sweet spot when the movement is the strongest. When you find the sweet spot, stay in it long enough and you will complete the stage. Pick open this lock to proceed through the door. New upgrade acquired. What? Yes, if we click on Garrett, now he has lockpicks. Your lockpicks can open any lock with a keyhole. They are automatically used when you try to open something that is locked. And I'll go ahead and say, use your mechanical eye to zoom in and get a better look at things far away. Up arrow to zoom in, down arrow to zoom out. Water arrow. The water arrow douses fire. Shoot it at torches to put them out, creating areas of darkness to sneak through. Blackjack. The blackjack silently knocks your opponents unconscious. Sneak up behind an opponent who is not alert and hit them on the back of the head. Dagger. The dagger is used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can also backstab opponents who are not alert by sneaking up behind them and attacking. Sweet. What they don't tell you, although you can see it in the tips, is that when you do find the sweet spot, if you left click, then you can bust right through. This lock, the sweet spots are up, right, left. Now we go up this ladder. You must learn to ambush your opponents. One hit from the blackjack can take down an opponent silently. To blackjack successfully, you must strike from behind when your opponent is not aware of your presence. Select your blackjack by pressing 2, then sneak up on the innkeeper. Attack with left mouse to knock him out. And again, the game forces us to do this. I'll show you. We could sneak past him without knocking him out pretty easy by just... <laughs> You're gonna get a video hiccup like that every time I have to quick load, so I apologize for that as well. Behold the non-instant load times. They shall be our constant companion. Anyway. <laughs> we could pretty easily slip past him unseen, but... It just teleports us back to the top of the ladder and forces us to blackjack him. But we have no objective to do so, so this is still a ghost bust, even though I don't have a choice. I remember. <clears throat> Kapow! If you leave bodies around, they might get noticed. Highlight a body by centering it on the screen, then press right mouse to pick the body up. Find a clear area to drop the body, then press right mouse again to drop it. Pick up the innkeeper, then hide his body in the ladder room you just came from. Easy enough. Your second objective is to locate Lord Julian. The guest registry on the counter may contain a clue about where he can be found. Highlight the book and press right mouse to read it. Guest list. Lord Julian, Peony Suite, the Earl of Warwick and Friends, Cotillion Suite, Aloysius Griggs, Dunroom, Baronet Mowbray and Companion, Cabriolet Suite, Dame Jala and Companion, Crystal Suite, Hayfirth MacDougall, Bungalow Room, Master Vorig and Apprentice, City View Room, Lord Pocrates, Wisteria Room. Lord Julian. <laughs> Wouldn't do to have anyone think he was just Julian. That completes our second objective, to find out what room Lord Julian is staying in. And we got a new note. Lord Julian is staying in the Peony Suite. One interesting thing, um... Startling animals, like cats and rats, if you get them to make too much noise, they actually will alert other AIs, so you have to be careful around them. Check your map to find out where Lord Julian's room is. It's always a good idea to check the map when you're trying to get somewhere. You can use M to view your map. I already looked at the map, so... Ah, yes. An observant thief keeps an eye out for valuable objects such as this goblet. The loot you steal can later be sold to your fence for cash. Highlight the goblet and press right mouse to steal it. So this goblet? Loot, 50. 1%. Not actually true, it's more like uh, 25%, but don't worry about it. You can press up against walls to decrease your visibility in the light gem and to fit into narrow shadows. To enter wall flattening mode, stand very close to a wall and press R. To exit wall flattening mode, press R again. Practice by flattening against this wall. Wall flattening is very useful. You see how much it dimmed my gem even though I'm standing right across from a bright light? 
Don't forget just how powerful that is. Sorry for the hiccup there, folks. My game crashed to desktop, and I forgot about the next hiccup when I say load the quick save. Hopefully that didn't set me back too far. I don't think it did. I had just done the wall flattening. Okay. So we have to wall flatten again. Anyway, as I was saying, don't underestimate just how powerful wall flattening is. That's the door to Lord Julian's room, but the guard is in your way. You can distract him by using a noisemaker arrow. Shoot the noisemaker arrow down the hall and he will run towards the noise to investigate. Use 9 to select the noisemaker arrow and left mouse to shoot it, then proceed through the door while the guard is distracted. Well, we are eventually going to have to distract him, because he's too close to the door for us to slip past him and... As I've sa said, nudging is not an option in Thief 3. There, we've arrived at the Peony Suite. But I'm going to show you how we can use their uh, be new behaviors soon, to our advantage. Good dark ale, nibbling on a nice leg of mutton, forgetting about this place. So I want to first alert him, green alert him rather, and then mind a bit of ale right now, when actually. he turns his head... I can run down the hall no, and wall flatten the rules. <laughs> and get past him. I'll show you what I mean. I've done oh I've only done it once, but it's possible. Oh, they'll all be at the tavern while I'm stuck here watching this bloody p uh, Did I just Okay, so when he turns his head <gasps> Ha! Who's making all the noise then? So you see how difficult it can be, but... When he looks to his right, we can cut over out of his frontal cone of vision, and then he should snap his head to the left, and we should be okay. After I green alert him again. Did I just see... Oh! That really tears it! Well, that, I'm sorry, I bet the recording sounds really choppy. It's because it stops every time I hit quick load and I have to hit the record button again. Anyway, I know for a fact I can do this simply because I have done it before. So I will keep trying just to show you. Did I just see... Not sure, might have seen... Well, oh boy. I know someone's there. I okay. I think I need to get it. Obviously, this is still a supreme bust, but I think the I, best thing is if I can get him to look to his right first, then I can cross his central cone of vision, and then he'll snap his head to the left. Did I just see... What's that? Oh, but a yellow alerted for some reason. I say for some reason. The reason is probably that I was standing right in front of him, even if it says I was in a perfect shadow. Did I just see... What's all this? That really tears it! Well, there, there's another red alert. Ha! Good grief. Oh, come on. Don't even... You don't even give me the courtesy of a green alert? 
Just boom, straight to caught. Yikes. Maybe I should try to green. Oh, noise. So maybe I should try to green alert with noise instead. <laughs> What's all? He doesn't seem to notice. That, I mean, there's a delay in him noticing me. Maybe I should just make a break for it. Period. What do y'all think? Let's give it a whirl. Sound. Probably my own echo. Not sure. Might have seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna work. Speed seems to be the answer in this game, even more often than it was in Thief 1 and 2, because the, the time delay required to progress through the alert stages seems to be bigger in this game. So, let's make noise. Something. Wait for him to look. And run. Oh boy! Oh. Not really. Well, that didn't work out quite right either, but... That time when he only yellow alerted... If I had, I think, pushed a little farther and not crouched until I was in the shadow, I think I could have kept it to green. A noise? <laughs> Better see what that was. Maybe I need to just make sure I get far enough along to get out of his cone of vision like I was talking about initially. I know I did it once. A noise? <laughs> What's all? Nothing. Well, I need him to turn his head to the right first. Anyway, it's possible to get past him. To get down the hall and get the loot with nothing but a green alert. And... I'm, I intend to do it, because I've done it once before. A noise? Not sure. Might have seen. Anyway, you'll be, you'll be amazed at how much easier, really, the rest of the game is after this one guard. A noise? Did I? Oh boy! I can see that, you know! Because, of course, I think this is the one guard in the whole game that they actually built to be impossible to get past. Something? Oh boy! That really tears it! Okay, well, obviously I do have to crouch. It's a matter of finding the right time to slow down. If I can get far enough past him and then get to the wall beside him and flatten against it, that'll be perfect. Oh, noise! Oh boy! Well... Guess it was nothing. That time I tried to cut over too soon. Obviously. Something. Something over there. Oh boy. No dice there, although we did get away with only a yellow alert that time. Something. <laughs> Better see what that was. Well, he yellowed again. Like I've said, I kind of have to partially make up my own ghost rules for Thief 3 
I'm not allowing yellow alerts oh, noise. that are connected to my being seen or heard. Well, sometimes your ears play tricks on you. There we go. All right. The trick was not to go fast. How about that? So we got past him with only a green alert, which still a supreme bust. But now we can get that candlestick worth 25, brings me up to 37%. Now, of course, we still have to distract him because he's too close to the door to sneak past and the good old nudge is gone. If we try to nudge him, he'll just... uh immediately go into combat mode. So I'm going to try to I really see Oh boy. What the taff was that? I'm going to I was As you saw, it's very easy to just yellow alert him and pull him away from the door that way. Not bother with using a noisemaker arrow or any such garbage. So, that's what I'm going to go for. Oh, not again. Well, Guess it was nothing. <gasps> Can't have imagined that. Doesn't matter if he goes into the room or not. So there you have it. We can get in with just a yellow alert without using a noisemaker, but I'm calling a yellow alert related to being seen or heard a bust. So I'm saying that was a ghost bust. Anyway, get the plate off the table, worth 50, brings me up to 62%. Sometimes things don't work out as expected. Lord Julian isn't here in his room, and neither is the velvet bag you're trying to steal. Find a clue which tells you where he has gone, and your objectives will update with his new location. You can use O to view your objectives. For important information on how to complete them, use the scroll bar to see notes and restrictions below your objectives. First, get the candlestick, worth 25, brings me up to 75%, and let's read this note. My friend and honored Lord Julian, I will meet you in the Lancaster room tonight. I trust you will be mindful of the risks involved and be generous. Morris the Cook. His lordship has gone for a walk. Can't have gone far. So we've got, we've canceled the objective to steal Lord Julian's velvet bag from his room. We now need to find Lord Julian in the Lancaster room and steal his velvet bag from him. All right. Out this door, close it behind me. Get this goblet from the corner table. It's worth 25, brings me to 87%. And here's the Lancaster room. Lord Julian is here, sitting near the fire, talking to someone. His purse is right next to him. Sneak up and steal the purse without being seen or heard by anyone in the room. When you've got the purse, proceed into the kitchen. Stick to the shadows, walk silently, and move while your opponent's backs are turned. Keep an eye on your light gem and use your tools if you need to. If the guard starts searching for you, sneak away from him carefully. Shaft was closer by a thumb's width. The bloodline opal should rightfully be mine. If I may, my lord, I can help you. I know well, the castle. Well. well, you're a cook. What could you know? Every evening after sunset, the supply wagon comes through that gate and into the courtyard, and no one looks twice. Uh, Arrange for your men to be inside one evening, and then we cut our way through. Five good men against twenty and my accursed cousin. My lord, listen. There is a passage leading into the castle from the courtyard. I can open it for you when you give me the signal. The torch in the lion's head sconce. You must put it out. The lion's head torch. Yes. And when I reach the vault and hold the bloodline opal, I will take my place as head of the family. The Lady Elizabeth will be waiting. Even now, she'll be flattering him, giving me time to return. 
Only the medallion is the only key, my lord. You must keep hold of it. You forget Lord Ember has another. I hear he guards it with his life. My lord, I wish only for peace in the household. The opal is mine. I won that bet, Morris. I won it. Right, so they're done talking. I already grabbed the bag, which ticked off the fine Lord Julian in the Lancaster room and steal his velvet bag from him. Objective. One other thing to do. Grab the goblet behind the bar. Another 25 brings me to 100%. Now, if you go straight into this room, it spawns a guard and it tries to have you train on how to escape. In my first playthrough, I discovered that you could avoid being caught by putting out the torch. I've since discovered an even better way, one that avoids the red alerts from everyone back in this room as well. Immediately break left. Thought I saw something. Oh, you gotta be careful about the guard in the room, though. <laughs> so if we immediately turn left... And I'll wait for the guards back to be turned. Through, common folk. We can mantle over that barrel. <laughs> and if we just stay to this edge of the room, the guard never spawns. Check it out. Sneak all the way around the kitchen back here. Now the game is going to launch right into the next briefing, which is fine. I'm just going to save out here and click, uh, then click a yes to end the mission. And then to start the next video, I'll reload that save and skip the ending so we can watch the briefing at the beginning of the next mission. You get the idea. Proceed to the exit area to complete your final objective. When all your objectives are checked off, you will have finished the mission. Close one. But I've still got the goods. I'm gonna save right here. I'll reload this to start the next mission. But for now, I will just play the ending for you. You're about to end the mission. Do you want to continue? Yes. Nothing like mixing in society, especially if it comes with good loot. The velvet bag turned out to hold a bronze medallion stamped with a griffin. Valuable enough, but more interesting was the conversation I overheard between Lord Julian and the cook. Especially the part about a huge opal and a conspiracy for stealing it. I'd hate to have anyone but me get a stone like that but I need a better idea where to start looking. If I show the medallion to my fence, I'm sure he'll know more. Heartless Perry always does. So there you have it. Let's look at our stats. We had to play on normal, obviously. Took 10 minutes, stole 200 out of 200 loot, 100%. Times caught, zero. Opponents blackjacked, one, the innkeeper. Killed, zero. Stealthy kills, non combatants killed, zero. Picked one lock. No pockets picked, no bodies discovered, no damage taken, no healing taken. Game totals right now are the same, and that's that. I will load up this save right at the exit. When I come back to do the next mission, I will see you all then. That's checking in, cashing out, the start of Thief 3. Bye-bye.